Well, I'm sorry for that confusion, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is John O'Donnell. Let's get this started. And um, I apologize. Um, we had a few snafus there. Let me get this chat up. Uh, we're going to talk about demographics, deficits, and deleveraging. Uh, I'm the Chief Knowledge Officer of Online Trading Academy. I assume um, most of you know who Online Trading Academy is because they have uh, presented frequently uh, in my archive or several webinars and in, uh, of course, Sam Seiden is well known to the FX Street community, so welcome one and all. Um, our goal at Online Trading Academy is to set up high probability trading and investing in a global uncertain era. You know, I can promise you one thing. Uh, I've been engaged in a market since 1968. I'm um, perceived to be one of the founders of Online Trading Academy. I'm not the founder. The founder is A.L. Shahar, who founded the company in July of 97, but I joined him in the first quarter of 98. And we've had a lot of people come through our doors. Uh, many have been wildly successful, and then there's been a group who've been unsuccessful. But I can promise you one thing. Um, if you change nothing in your trading, nothing is really going to change when it comes to results. Now, I'm going to try to blast through this. I'm sorry about the late start, but um, we know that markets are really a roller coaster ride, especially in the world we live in today. And I want to talk about why I believe we're going to continue to see serious headwinds in our global economy, and, but why it's going to present lots of trading opportunities uh, going forward. You know, I'm uh, a student of, of, of markets. Uh, I'm a student of the ebb and flow extremes of bull and bear markets. Um, I've been blessed with uh, the opportunity to have multiple tutors and coaches that from the Austrian School of Economics that has always had me focused uh, on short-term trading opportunities, but within the context of the big picture. Um, and I, I trade virtually all asset classes uh, simply because there's opportunities in all asset classes, and many of them are highly correlated. But if you take a look at the uh, S&P 500 from 1930 through 2012, you see we have alternating secular bear markets to bull markets to bear markets to bull markets to bear markets. This is the pattern that is going to continue going forward. But it just so happens um, that we are in a secular bear market today. Many of you think we're probably think we're in a new rally um, uh, because this great bull market, cyclical bull market, within the secular period um, that really started in, that cyclical bull started in March of 2009. But if you take a look at the whole pattern, and we'll take a look at that today, uh, there are going to be um, lots of downs and volatility in this market going forward. Now, I happen to believe uh, that this picture is of the nominal Dow Jones Industrial Average. Um, uh, the, the previous secular bear market, and this is the pattern of that market from 1965 through 1981. Uh, I think uh, if uh, our vision of the future, at least my vision of the future here at Online Trading Academy, is that markets are going to look more like this going forward. So if the hard left edge over here were 2013, this is what I think the next decade is going to look like. I think there's going to be a lot of rich, trading opportunities, and and as Sam Seiden would say, we want to short sell in the supply zones and, of course, go long or buy cover in the demand zones. And um, whether you're a pessimist or an optimist, I think Winston Churchill had this right. Uh, he said a pessimist sees the difficulty in every opportunity, and he says an opportunist uh, sees the opportunity in every difficulty. So why don't you type into chat, who are you being? When you're participating in the markets today and you see all, you read all the same news sources that we read, uh, are you an optimist or are you a pessimist um, uh, going forward? Because you have a choice. You can either get up every day and get engaged in the markets, uh, you know, from a pessimist 
perspective, or you can get up and participate from an optimist per perspective. Uh, <laughs> I like what Fernando has to say there. That's kind of kind of nice. But let's take a look at what are some of the headwinds that are really driving all this price volatility. And again, I'm I'm not I'm not saying this to be uh, an apocalypse of gloom and doom. I, quite frankly, we have a radio show. It's called Power Trading Radio. I believe many links to Power Trading Radio are also posted um, on the Online Trading Academy uh, pages there at FX Street. And uh, Merlin Rothfeld, uh, who's the co-host of the show has kind of branded me the ambassador of opportunity. Uh, and bear markets and bull markets present wonderful, rich targets and opportunities uh, to be long and short uh, at the appropriate time, and as Sam Seiden would say, in the appropriate supply and demand zones. That being said, let's talk about some of the macro conditions that are going to drive this price volatility, at least from our perspective. Um, number one is demographics. The interesting thing about the study of demographics in the developed world, and I define the developed world, quite frankly, as, as Western Europe, America, and Japan. If I look at the aggregate uh, population, uh, consumption pattern, um, productivity ratio, uh, income per capita, etc., uh, the developed world is really the, the dog that wags the tail. Um, you know, you're looking at those three regions of the world representing over 60% of global GDP and output. And what's interesting about consumption uh, is that consumption patterns wane as the population ages. Um, there is a spending cycle, and demographers who have studied this at all levels of government in the developed world know that as that there are peak spending years as as a as a family is formed, and then as the kids leave the nest, go to college, become productive, uh, the as the aging uh, residents of that household uh, change their consumption pattern and lifestyle, it really impacts uh, global consumption of goods and services. Um, and of course. You know that there's aging demographics in Europe. Their demographics are older than America. That is Western Europe. Uh, Japan's demographics are much older than America. So from a demographic point of view, if I were Bill Gross, I would probably call America uh, the cleanest dirty shirt in the laundry. Or as my friend Mike McMahon likes to say, America's demographics are the equivalent of the prettiest girl in an ugly girl contest. But yes, the globe is aging very quickly, especially in the developed world. Now, what's very interesting, this is a chart put forward by HS Dent Foundation. Many of you may have seen it, or perhaps it's new for some of you, uh, but we've had Harry Dent uh, on our radio show, Power Trading Radio. You can listen to that interview. It's posted in the archive at powertradingradio.com. Very well may even be posted in the archive there at FX Street. But basically what he's done in blue is take the Dow Jones industrial average and adjusted for inflation and laid it over the in red, the immigration adjusted births lagging for peak spending of that average American household in America between the ages of 46 and 50. And what we see with this fast aging population demographic profile in America is the headwinds Headwind number one uh, for the bear market that we are forecasting will continue. Uh, our position is we are in a secular bear market. We'll look out a little closer here in a moment, and it will continue very well for the rest of this decade. Um, the second headwind uh, that is very compatible with the demographic challenge is debt. Uh, that is too much debt in the developed world as a percent of GDP. Now, this is the American profile of total debt or total credit as a percent of GDP uh, from 1915 through 2011. And um, what's very interesting about this picture, if I were to put next to it, the um, debt as a percent of GDP in Europe is worse than America. And, of course, the debt of GDP in Japan is off the charts far worse uh, than either America or Western Europe 
and consequently you're seeing uh, I'm looking for a very cheap yen going forward. I see their central bank uh, progressing to continue to do quanti periods of quantitative easing. Uh, John Molden likes to call the Japanese economy, and I think it's very descriptive, a bug in search of a windshield economy. And the two master headwinds of aging demographics in Japan and too much debt as a percent of GDP um, is really uh, the net death knell uh, for their economy. And as many of you know, you've seen the Nikkei chart. Their bull market started in 1989. They've had 22 consecutive years of bearish uh, markets uh, with a couple of counter-trend rallies that have failed. Their real estate market peaked in 1989, and they've had 20-plus years of decline in real estate prices in excess of 65% of the average home in Japan, and it stayed down for over 20 years. So aging demographics is not bullish for equities. Aging demographics with a combination of too much debt is not bullish for the real estate space or the equity space. Notice here in America that we've had a trend change right here with this uh, hard right edge of this particular chart, and that is the phenomenon of deleveraging. And some of the deleveraging that's going on is primarily taking place in uh, the private sector. Now, this is a very important chart, and we should probably spend a little bit of time on this particular chart. This is the total debt as a percent of GDP in the United States uh, going back to 1870. Um, and the black line from 1870 uh, through 2012 is a very accurate picture of total debt as a percent of GDP. Now, arguably, America has an economy um, of about $14 trillion. And depending on how you want to compute debt, um, there are those that claim America's debt as a percent of GDP um, is as low as the federal component of debt as a percent of GDP. I think it's very interesting here. Note that how debt as a percent of GDP peaked in the 1929, 19, early 1930s, and you can see how it declined rapidly even in through World War II. But take a look at federal debt here. Everybody's worried about the federal debt component. Everybody talks about all the de all the federal debt outstanding. And you can see the little uptick in federal debt, certainly since 2007. Uh, the gray bars in the background are periods where we've had recessions. Uh, notice that recessions are much less frequent today than they were previous to 1930. And, but take a look at this. This is the picture that everybody's missing. When I'm talking about total debt as a percent of GDP that I'm very fearful of, and it's the private component of debt as a percent of GDP. The private component of debt as a percent of GDP, and let's assume where they crossed over here uh, in the early 1940s, has zoomed from 80% of GDP all the way up past 320% of GDP, and notice how the private component of debt as a percent of GDP is deleveraging at an accelerating rate while the federal government continues to borrow deficit spend. And as uh, Merlin and I like to say on our radio show, uh, put a Band-Aid on a giant sucking chest wound. This is the giant sucking chest wound. So the deleveraging component of that we're seeing, uh, which is a headwind to economic growth, both in Europe, America, and Japan, most of that deleveraging is taking place in the private component of debt, not necessarily in the federal government component of debt. And I think that's a very important distinction. When you see people out there that are talking about runaway inflation, they're making the assumption that the government is just going to print money ad nauseum, cut every tree down in Canada, and just flood the system uh, with, you know, quantitative easing uh, to infinity. But in fact, what you really should keep your finger on the pulse of is the private component of debt as a percent of GDP. And the reason I pay, bring this to your attention is that component of debt as a percent of GDP is not attached to a printing press. 
you know, do you have a printing press to pay off your mortgage? Um, does the state of California have a printing press to print up dollars to pay off their unfunded liabilities of their pension program? Why, of course not. So the only component of debt as a percent of GDP is the federal uh, debt. Now, that assumes the bond vigilantes don't show up and lose confidence in America, uh, like the bond vigilantes showed up in Spain, Portugal, and Greece not too uh, long ago, uh, causing all kinds of credibility challenges. But I really want you to distinguish. I think this chart over here does a very good job of differentiating why deflation um, in the private sector, that is the deleveraging of debt in this private sector, is taking place at an accelerated pace, at a much faster pace, quite frankly, in aggregate, than the government can deficit spend. And I think that's a very – give me a, a give me some chat feedback if you understand that principle. Type in yes or no if that makes a lot of sense to you, uh, the principle I have just described. Because unless you understand that principle of debt deleveraging, both voluntarily and involuntarily in the private sector, it is not very easy to get your arms around the fact that we could have a very serious deflation going forward. Now, here's another very important alarming component of debt as a percent of GDP. Remember, it, it, which is the cumulative effect of too much debt as a percent of GDP. In the previous chart, I want you to note, from 1870 to 1920, debt as a percent of GDP was about 150% of GDP. It ballooned up into the early 30s to over 300% of GDP, and then crashed all the way into 1950, back down to about 150% of GDP. But notice between 1950 and, say, 1980s, about three decades, that is a percent of GDP range between 140 to 160 percent of GDP. You know, things really got crazy starting right here around 1982. And we know who was elected there. And this is where you had this significant change. But as debt starts to accumulate over decades, what you end up with is just too much debt. And so what you end up with is massive, new massive debt coming into the system, be the public or private sector, creates spreading insolvency. And you get diminishing marginal productivity from the new debt that comes into the economy. And the same thing has happened to Japan, and the same thing happened is happening today in Western Europe. Now take a look at this as it relates to America. Back in the 1960s, when we had relatively low debt, cumulative debt as a percent of GDP. When the economy took on a new dollar of debt, it got about a 90 cent lift in marginal productivity from the deployment of that debt in the system. But as time went on and debt started to accumulate, and you see that in this rising um, uh, growth, accelerating almost out of control growth of debt as a percent of GDP, meaning that the debt component is growing at a much faster rate than output, what you see is this curve starts to look like this. You start to see a diminishing marginal productivity of every new dollar that comes into the system. Here we were in 1994. Instead of getting 90 cents of lift from the new debt, we only get about 30 cents worth of lift. And look what's happened since 2007. It's actually gone negative. So the solution to the problem, if you understand what this chart is telling us, is that the solution is not more debt. The solution is not to kick the can down the road to the next generation and put another debt band-aid on a giant sucking debt chest wound. At the end of the day, take a look at this. It's now gone negative. And today, for every new dollar of debt that we take on in the American system, we're getting a negative 50 cents of productivity. Ladies and gentlemen, quantitative easing, deficit spending, is not the solution. The solution is to cut spending. The solution is to clean up the balance sheet and to clean up and let the market reprice assets and purge the malinvestment out of the system financed in the era of cheap liberal credit. Now, this is not Keynesian economic principles. 
Online Trading Academy follows the work of the Austrian School of Economics, brought forward by Ludwig von Mises and made popular by Friedrich Hayek. It came out of Vienna in the late 1800s, and they have a totally different analysis of the debt problem and a totally different solution to fix the problem. And if you want information on the Austrian School of Economics, I encourage you to visit their website, Mises, M-I-S-E-S dot org. And I'll type that into chat. Go to Mises dot org or send me an email, john at O-T-A-H-Q dot com. And I'll send you links to various other economic reports and webinars that I have produced on this topic free of charge if you want to understand the difference between making trading and investing decisions with a Keynesian perspective of the world or making one with an Austrian perspective of the world. And I assure you, ladies and gentlemen, the Austrian perspective of the world is a more intelligent, balanced view, which net defines the solution much differently than the Austrians. You see, at the end of the day, this is really our problem. Our problem is in the developed world that governments and politicians have made too many promises to the electorate that they cannot finance. And they certainly cannot finance by, you know, dramatically raising taxes. So they have chosen to monetize debt through vehicles like quantitative easing and deficit spending. This is our particular problem in the United States. Uh, last year, we did about $3.3 trillion of spending in red, and we only brought in about $2 trillion of revenue. What bridges that gap? Deficit spending and the printing of money. Now, regardless of what political side of this spectrum you live on, whether you're a liberal or a uh, conservative or a libertarian, there are five truths that I think almost – all of us cannot disagree with, regardless of your political persuasion. Number one, you cannot legislate the poor into prosperity by legislating the wealthy out of prosperity. Number two, what one person receives without working for, another person must work for without receiving. Number three, the government cannot give to anybody anything the government does not first take away from someone else. And number four, this is my favorite one, you cannot multiply wealth by dividing it. And number five, when half the people get the idea that they do not have to work because the other half is going to take care of them, and when the other half gets the idea that it does no good to work because somebody else is going to get what they work for, that is the beginning of the end of a nation. And we have seen this throughout history. Now, I don't know if any of you on this webinar agree or disagree with those five principles. Uh, you're certainly welcome to opine or type into chat whether you agree or disagree with any of those five principles. But by and large, regardless of your political persuasion, where you live in the world, I doubt if you will disagree with those five fundamental principles. And there aren't many things that liberals, conservatives, and libertarians can equally embrace and support. And I would encourage you to share these principles with the politicians and your friends in your neighborhood. Ladies and gentlemen, um, there are lots of headwinds, and I want to step forward. I know we're starting a little bit late. I don't know um, how much longer you would like me to go. Uh, but our forecast here at Online Trading Academy is that GDP will range um, somewhere between 2 and 2.5%, 2.5%, uh, 2 growth in the real, 2% nominal growth in the United States. That's not real. That's nominal. That's not adjusted for inflation is the equivalent of a stall speed. And you know what happens to airplanes that try to levitate and maintain a stall speed. It's not going to be very pretty. Um, wealth, new wealth, will be created by a few. Um, and, but it's going to be created uh, by and large in the developed world 
at a very weak pace. Um, you know, I'm not forecasting an all-out economic uh, depression, uh, but I am forecasting, I think John uh, Malden has a term for it, and I think it's very descriptive, a muddle-through economy, except the muddle-through component, the mud is getting deeper, it's getting thicker, it's more viscous, and it's more difficult to navigate in. And I don't see anything it, through 2013, we'll talk about 2014 uh, later, but I don't see, uh, uh, I think, basically more of the same. Um, construction is almost dead in the water, uh, and it's going to be slow for years ahead of time because we built uh, too many homes uh, with malinvestment in the credit uh uh, binge environment, and now we're going through the credit purge cycle in that particular sector, literally across the developed world. And and most of the statements I'm making here in this slide is for the U.S. economy, but uh, much of it will splash over, uh, and we could make the same claims for Western Europe and for Japan, as a matter of fact. Employment um, uh, will eventually increase, especially in those sectors that are tax favored under the Obama administration. Uh, but I expect the um, unemployment rate to stay somewhere between 7.5 and 8.2% range. Uh, I'm looking for inflation uh, in to average somewhere between 2, 2.5%, uh, let's say 2.5%. Uh, on the other hand, there are many sectors uh, where they're going through a credit purge phenomenon where, in fact, there will be uh, deflation, and I'll show you some charts on that in a moment, especially in certain commodities. And I expect, I think the Fed will be accommodating and keep interest rates low for some period of time, uh, uh, you know, going forward. That's kind of my vision of, of what's going on in the future. And let's talk about unemployment for a moment. Uh, the politicians, I think most of us know that politicians are very manipulative, and how they position content and, and, and data uh, for their political uh, uh, popularity. But, you know, ladies and gentlemen, we, when we talk about unemployment rates, there's both the U3 rate and the U6 rate, and those get a little bit confusing. Uh, but if we measured the unemployment the way we did during the 1930s, uh, today's unemployment rate would be worse than the Great Depression. You see, in the 1930s, the, the metrics we used to measure and define unemployment showed a 15% uh, unemployment rate in 1931, got as high as 22.9% unemployment in 1932. But take a look at these rates over here on the right column between 2009 and 2011, minus 21%, minus 22%, minus 23%. So if we were using the same ruler, um, the same metric of measurement that we used, that the government used in the 1930s to measure unemployment or underemployment, um, it's a lot worse than what the politicians and the pundits are reporting in the media uh, if we were, you know, had a consistent metric of measurement. Um, let's talk about the, federal, the role of the Federal Reserve. At the end of the day, we believe that interest, the interest rates will ultimately be determined by the market. Um, you know, the Fed can play the, all the games they want to play. The central banks of the world are flooding the system with liquidity right now because the private sectors are both voluntarily and involuntarily deleveraging. We talked about in that in the previous slide. And that's the reason with all this massive quantitative easing and deficit spending we've seen, by the three central banks of those regions we just described, why there isn't a lot of inflation in the system is because the government of the central bank uh, sees a lot of content that you and I don't see. They have their finger on the pulse of a lot of economic variables that give them confidence to keep rates low, but at the end of the day, uh, it's like pushing on a string. They can't twist your arm and make you and I buy a new automobile or accelerate our conspicuous consumption pattern that we have had in the previous cycle. So let's take a look at the history of secular bear markets. 
Uh, I believe we are still in a secular bear market, and let's put this in perspective for you. Um, this is the Standard & Poor's Composite Index from 1870 through 2012, and it is adjusting the uh, value of the S&P Composite Index. That's not the S&P 500. Uh, it's adjusted for inflation using the Consumer Price Index. Now, before you jump on me for using the Consumer Price Index, we also know that governments have a history of changing the metrics of how they measure the CPI. Um, there's some other metrics we can use that the government doesn't can't too easily uh, modify, like the producer price index, and I even use an index where I take the Dow and the S&P and divide it by uh, grams of gold. Uh, so I've got a currency or a benchmark that it's very difficult for the uh, uh, central bank to print gold, uh, as you can imagine. But let's take a look at the history of secular bear markets. First of all, we've had, we are in the fourth secular bear market since 1870. This is secular bear market number one. This is secular bear market number two. This is secular bear market number three. And this is the fourth one we're in right now. They're rare. They happen, uh, for a lot of different reasons, but I want you to note they are not, um, dependent on any particular political party being in power. They're not dependent on a particular innovation cycle. And the bear market didn't really care whether we want a fiat currency or a gold standard. They are what they are. Uh, markets go to periods of overbought. Uh, we want to be net sellers of those markets. And then they evolve to periods of oversold. And we want to be net buyers of those markets. Now, at Online Trading Academy, through the great work of our faculty and Sam Seiden, uh, we have a very specific methodology to define these overbought and oversold uh, conditions. We generally call them supply and demand zones. Uh, you can certainly um, take a look at Sam, some of Sam Seiden's uh, archived webinars there at FX Street if you'd like more information, at least cursory information on how we use them. But if you really want uh, the full trading plan and the full set of skills to apply them to your trading decisions, you really need to come to an online trading academy class. And I'm pleased to announce, by the way, that not Online Trading Academy has 34 centers across the world because we host our classes in brick and mortar learning labs that we host. Uh, but we also now host our learning events online. Um, and if you want more information on that, um, you need to contact an Online Trading Academy office or send me an email and I'll get you in touch with the right people. But here's where we are now. Our secular bear market started in March of 2000 and let's Let's blow that up and take a harder look at it. This is another uh, metric I've used for years that very rarely do you see it uh, posted in media anywhere, which is to ask the question, is the market overvalued, undervalued, or fairly valued at any given moment in time? And, you know, valuation is a relative term. Something is either cheap or expensive relative to something else or some other period of time. If you take a look at this particular chart, we are measuring the market cap of the combination of the New York Stock Exchange and NASDAQ as a percent of GDP from 1924 through 2012. And this is a very, very important chart. It gives us a lot of information uh, about where is the U.S. market. Now, notice uh, in this whole period, what created this great bubble boom in valuation, uh, where the market went from down here at roughly 30% of GDP, which was obviously a very oversold uh, condition, to over 180% in 2000, which was a very overbought condition. And notice that all these peaks of overbought and all these valleys of oversold uh, valuation marks are never never sustainable. Matter of fact, if we go back and look at the previous chart, and you can do that on the recording that I'm sure FX Street will post uh, on the web on their website, uh, you will see that none of these extremes of overbought or oversold conditions, quite frankly, have ever been sustainable. And that's why we're traders. That's why we, we abandon an online trading academy, our buy and hold biases for virtually any asset class in any time frame. 
Now let's take a look at this. Notice that since 2000, the valuation of the market has declined from 180% of GDP in first quarter of 2000 all the way down to 118% of GDP today. And that's where it's at today, with the Dow at approximately 13.3. Now, if I were to connect these lower lows and these lower highs, I end up with a channel and it looks to me like the market is attempting to mean revert to the red line. This red line is 63.3% of GDP. And it appears to me that the market is headed lower and it wants to retest the, where it went in March of 09, right here, when the market got all the way down to 72.79% of GDP. It's a, not... not to, and notice we've had various periods where, where markets have mean reverted. And this is very, quite frankly, very common for all asset classes. As a matter of fact, if they don't mean revert, it's grossly uncommon. So I think we should expect more mean reversion. Now let's take this, now remember, from 2000 through 2012, the economy has been growing at 2.5% a year. So if you take 2.5% a year times 12 years, you're talking about what? 27% um, growth in GDP? Okay, but we've seen the stock market not reflect that growth at all. The market is trying to find the proper valuation, and the proper valuation is probably going to go back and retouch and might even a dip below the red line, which would be at about 63% of GDP. Now, if that happens, that takes the Dow black below where it was in March of 09. I want you to keep that number in mind. This is what the market looks like today when we look at the S&P. Uh, this is the picture of a secular bear market that started in 2000, uh, March of 2000 to be exact, and this is simply the nominal price of the S&P. Now, I want to show you a little trick I have used to ask a very important question, and you can do the math uh, a little bit later. I want you to know that in 2000, the dollar index was trading at $1.20. So if you were to take in and ask this question, what is the, pur the global purchasing power parity of the S&P in 2000? The way you would configure that out is you take the S&P, well, let's assume it's at 1,500, and you'd multiply it by the dollar index. Most of you should know what the dollar index is. And then it was $1.20. So somebody, I don't have a calculator handy here. Somebody do the math for me. If I take 1,500 and multiply it by $1.20, what was the purchasing power of the S&P in March of 2000? Yeah, no problem. Somebody do that math for me and type it into chat. What is a dollar? It's 1800 on the S&P. In other words, that's the purchasing power of the S&P in, in uh, 2000. Now let's take a look at the S&P today at 1460. The S&P today is at approximately 1460. What is, but the, what is the dollar index trading at? Does anybody know? Well, the dollar index is trading at 80 cents. So what I have to have to do to compute the purchasing power parity, very good, Don. Let's, if I take 80 cents times 1460, Don, what do you come up with? Come on, class, get engaged with this. You'll, yeah, it's about 1168. So the purchasing power parity of the S&P has lost over 600 points. So when you're looking and measuring things with a non-constant metric of measurement, you have to adjust the valuation. And what you and I should be asking is, what is the purchasing power parity of the Dow? How many? And think about this. I use gold as well. In 2000, the Dow was trading right here at 11,700. Took 44 ounces of gold to buy one unit of the Dow. Today, the Dow is trading at 13,300. It takes about seven and a half ounces of gold to buy one unit of the Dow. 
In other words, we are in a stealth bear market. And this chart right here, and I'll show you the next one, bears it out very nicely. And I'll kind of end on this chart. I'll leave it open for a couple of questions. But basically, ladies and gentlemen, this is the S&P composite adjusted for inflation. There are other ways and other metrics that I can teach you at Online Trade Academy to use. But this is where we are today. We are in a long-term secular bear market. My prognosis is there's high probability the secular bear market will end in 2016. There's a lot of reasons we believe that. Uh, send me an email, john at OTAHQ. I'll send you some more documentation on how we come up with that particular metric. I've enjoyed being with you today. My name is John O'Donnell. I'm with Online Trading Academy. We have lots of presentations. We, we love our friends there at FX Street. They do a great job of uh, presenting this content, uh, not only from Online Trading Academy presenters, but from many other uh, wonderful service organizations across the world. God bless you all. Good luck. And I hope all your trades are green in 2013.